to Look into Time in the Mystery. Time in the Mystery. With Mike Benjamin. Mike Benjamin. Thank you. Thank you. What's up, dudes? It's Mike Mangione, and this is Time in the Mystery Conversations with me. And today's guest is Mr. Alex Ebert from the band Edward Sharp and the Magnetic Zeros. And we went we went deep sea diving together, man. We it was intense. He like he grabbed me like a gator and he brought me down to the bottom. He just barrel rolled and little bubbles blooped out of my mouth. And then we went back to the top and I was like, bro, that was intense. He's like, I know. I'm an I'm an intense dude. And I'm like, yeah, you are, but I like it. He's like, I like it too. So get ready for that. It's a good one. It's a long one. And but we get in it. So you're gonna come with us and it's gonna be fun. Uh, Mystery Monday, my bi-monthly newsletter that happens twice a month. It's going strong. I've been having a lot of people sign up for it, so thank you. And if you're interested in receiving free music and getting an element of mystery sent to your inbox twice a month, well, then go to MikeMangione.com, my website, and sign up for Mystery Monday. You just give me your email there, and I'll send you a download on the spot. And then every Monday after the podcast is released, you will get something you'll get a a newsletter and it's going to be great i think and uh, it's going to have a download so check it out mystery monday guys i uh i have patrons people that support this music and this podcast that i do uh if you're interested in becoming part of this mission do it all right right now i do i do a podcast here's an example of how it'll help i'm doing a podcast every other week well i want to get to every week and with your help with patrons help uh, you know, I'll be able to do that. So please consider doing it. Go to patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Mike Mangione and become a patron. Any bit on a monthly basis goes a long way. Patreon.com forward slash Mike Mangione. Do it. All right. Subscribe to the podcast, please. It's a good deal for me. It's a good deal for you. Together, we'll have a good deal. The new deal, as I like to call it. Uh, What else we got here? Mm, I got new patrons. I want to mention them. And of course, they're going to get nicknames like uh, Deanne Chiller Miller, right? Or Katie from Canada Scrubs. I call you Scrubs because you told me on Facebook that you listen to my podcast while you scrub the shower. So Katie from Canada, thank you. I appreciate your support. I hope you're doing well up there. Uh, How about Gabby uh, Cromer? I call you Gabby Crow My Goodness because you're a patron and I love you. So thank you. Tiffany Hunt, I call you Tiffany Hunt the Funt. Funt the Hunt. I don't know what that means, but I call you that. And I just played your wedding recently, so I hope you guys are doing great. Thank you for the honor. That was a lot of fun. Uh, let's see. Peter, Peter Androstic, I call you Pete the Heat because you are an intense individual and I love you. Last time I saw you, we had a couple beers, sat in my car, and listened to Rage Against Machine. So thanks for still being my friend after that and uh, going above and beyond and becoming a patron. I appreciate it. You're a beautiful man. I have one more patron. I almost forgot. How could I forget? My mom. Yeah, my mom became a patron, which is awesome, except why did it take you eight episodes, mom? Why eight episodes? Did you need to be, did I need to prove it with the first seven not cutting it? And then all of a sudden, or the first six and then seven was like, push you over the edge. And you're like, yeah, I can, I guess I can support this guy. Thanks, mom. I really mean it. You've always been there for me, except for the first seven episodes, of course. Okay. So Alex Ebert, uh, I've known Alex, uh, for a little bit and his drummer, a guy named Josh Klotz, I've known longer and actually Josh and the bass player of the band, uh, Seth Ford Young, uh, played on my last record. And uh, their engineer, a guy named Matt Linich, uh, engineered it. And so I've gotten to know those guys a little bit. And over time, uh, when I've had conversations with Alex, they've been really good. And the last one that we had, it was so in the vein of what this podcast is about that I said, dude, next time I'm in your neck of the woods, we're going to do this for real. And he said, for real? I said, for real. So we did it. I was in New Orleans and uh, stopped by his house slash studio. And we got in it. And I think what I'm most excited for you guys to experience is uh, this is a man who's intentional. Every breath, every step has an intention. It, it doesn't just blow in the wind. It moves in the wind with a seed attached and the intention to land and take root. And uh, I love it. He's got a beautiful mission. I'm not going to tell you what it is because I want you to get to it organically in this conversation. But his mission is beautiful and worth uh, 
worth the effort. And it's a mission I actually, I share in my own language, in my own way. I share this mission. And it was, it was so comforting to find somebody who has it in, in, the, in their own DNA and he just lives and breathes it. So uh, it's something special. He has, in this, in, this, in this conversation, he has probably one of the longest pauses somebody's ever had to my face. He just stops talking. And I, I honestly, I looked at him, I thought maybe he just shut off, like he was done. I was like, well, all right, that was fun. But he was still, it looked like he was actually um, thinking. And man, but it was long. And I was thinking, well, I should edit this out. And, and then I was like, no way. I'm not going to rob you of this. This is quite the, quite the pause. So enjoy that one. Thanks for doing that, Alex. That was fun. Uh, guys, sit back. Wear something comfortable. Go to the bathroom. Get ready. This is Time of the Mystery Conversations with Alex Eber. <laughs> Do you want to eat more? Or should, or, mm. You're good? Now that's good. Is it sweet? Now that's good. Nice and sweet. That it, is happening. It looks, uh, it looks like something. Stuff. Yeah, it does. <laughs> porridge. It's the difference between porridge and oatmeal. The, the consistency and color. The more it looks like so. dirt. The more it looks like dirt, the wetter it is, I think, the more porridgey it is. There's a lot. So I kind of gave you the, the idea of what. I'm going for, you know, a little bit, but I think it's kind of, it's really in your wheelhouse. Uh, but you know, we spoke a little bit in Milwaukee about connection and stuff like that, but uh, I want to get into that. But I think first, like just to set the table a little bit, you grew up in LA, Yep. right? Where in LA? Uh, in the Valley. So, uh, the, the typical sort of, um, typical idea of what the Valley is, the Sherman Oaks, Van Nuys, Studio City, North Hollywood, sort of quadrant, Valley Girl quadrant, the Galleria, um, Ventura Boulevard, um, sort of that that tacky 80s valley. Yeah. Yeah. What um, did your parents do? My dad was a, and he's retired now, uh, a psychotherapist, and my mother, uh, an actress. Yeah, okay. my dad. They were both were actors. That's how they met in acting class. In, in from in Los Angeles, in New York, in New York. Yeah, what got him to the West? Uh, I don't know. My dad came out, or my mom came. I think my dad was going, and then my mom went with him, kind of thing. And you know, L.A. is. Um, I'm, I'm sure it had something to do with with acting, but my dad was, I think, already starting to leave acting and study. Uh, psychotherapy. Well, that's quite the jump. It's actually almost the identical profession. Really? Yeah, it's almost the same thing. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, like if you've ever been to an acting class. I have not. Um, a method acting class, that is. Okay. Um, it's a bunch of people letting out emotion in the rawest way they can through the imagination through the portal uh, of the imagination, which unleashes you to sort of a, a quantum freedom of emotional outlets. So as a elephant, as a dying elephant, for instance, an, an acting coach might tell you, uh, you know, in, in, in a method acting class, uh, bring in an animal. Mm -hmm. And they don't mean actually bring in an right. animal. They mean you be, you bring, you be an animal next time you come to class. Okay. And you, you bring in an animal. So you, you, you choose an animal and then you bring it to class. And then, so the first class I witnessed was Charlie Lawton's class. Who's, did you go to a class? Of, yeah. Okay. My mother brought me, I was 15. Okay. Um, he was Pacino's sort of mentor. And I sat on these seats, sort of like miniature bleachers because it's a miniature theater and watched everyone instantly go into um, happen to be animals. So everyone is on the floor, generally, on either all fours or rolling around, sobbing, screaming, whining, uh, doing the sort of 
the the truncation of a, of an elephant's trunk or the uh, you know the <laughs> truncation uh, the, yeah the the whine or squeal of a chimpanzee and and they're all it was like being in a mental institution I see um, <laughs> and there we make the jump to psychotherapy psychotherapy different than psychoanalysis psychotherapy really especially in the eighties late seventies um, when my dad was first practicing kind of left over from the experimental hippie sort of uh, era of role-playing, um, physical sort of rolfing, they call it, like like deep tissue body work in combination with, um, with sort of going through memories of childhood, uh, oh. a lot of, a lot of sort of a lot of similar sort of tropes of like method acting is like mm-hmm. dive into yourself and then sh- shit it or puke it out um, in the most sort of meaningful, visceral way. And then mm-hmm. we'll deal with it later. The difference between acting and psychotherapy really, or an acting class and psychotherapy is that with acting class, the acting teacher isn't prepped or doesn't know how to then lead you into a balanced place after the class. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that explains a lot. It explains a lot. <laughs> Whereas with psychotherapy, then after you've let go of this giant emotion, then you have then you're supposed to sit down and actually work through it and talk about it and get to a good place. Yeah. Um Yeah. So I remember my first acting class at the actor's studio in in LA bringing in a fabric and I brought in um flannel sheets. And uh, again, you don't actually bring them in. They're just in your, mem- in your mind. <laughs> and, um, and so I'm sitting in my chair and I, you, first you relax, you get totally relaxed. And that's the one thing I really learned, by the way, about the creative process and truth, essentially, um, is that relaxation is sort of prerequisite mm-hmm. to an actual total expression of truth. Mm-hmm. You have to be allowing of yourself. So anyway, so I sit there in the chair, I get really relaxed and I, uh, and then I start bringing in the memory of the flannel sheet. How you're 15. No, no. At this point I'm probably 20 something, 20. I was either 20. It couldn't have been during my, my stint of heroin. So (laughs) I was either 19 or I was probably 23, 24. Okay. Um, uh, is in between there. I didn't do anything like didn't that. Didn't much. No, I I I only made music and painted during that time. Okay. Um. Uh. But yeah. So I'm sitting there in in, in the chair, and then and this memory of flannel sheets starts coming back to me. Did my, you pre- my, did you prep for like? Did you know? Did you reflect on flannel sheets before you walked into this class? Or? Yeah, 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 I did. I, okay. I reflected on it. I sort of got it. I, I was feeling them. I was, I was remembering them. And in particular, one memory of uh, my girlfriend in high school had flannel sheets. And there was nothing wrong about them except that perhaps they got a little hot. Yeah. So anyway, um, I bring them in. And I'm, I start incorporating, you know, she's walking us through. She's like, now start bringing in your whatever you, the object you brought in. So I start incorporating flannel sheets into my relaxation. And before you know it, like I'm getting really, really, really emotional and hot. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I start just like sobbing, basically unwittingly working through whatever pain or residual whatever was left over from that relationship yeah. um, and, and really letting it go. And of course, the more I'm sobbing, the more the teacher's like, good, Alex, good. You know, like you're really oh, working man. through anyway. And then at the end of the thing, it's like, okay, class is over. And like, you're sitting in the chair and you're like, Vulnerable. you're being told you just did a great <laughs> job. And now you get up and you get your shit and you get in your car and you drive home. <laughs> and I remember on the drive home, just being like, I feel... I feel kind of fucked up yeah. right now, like a little a smoothie or out of sorts. So my, my father's variety of that was he built a soundproof office above the garage and the soundproofing was for these kinds of moments with his... Uh, for them to really go for, for it. For them to really yeah. let out yells and screams. And Did he, he, note, did he feel like 
the insanity of that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah I don't think so. I think that, you know, or he the was, insanity of, of, of the acting class. He felt he did not, you know, one insanity, it's funny because it's all, it's all subjective. It's very easy to see other people's insanity sure. and not, and not really be able to see your own. And I think that, that he really thought that acting, he, he came to believe that acting was stupid mm. and sort of like this just perpetual, should exist in a land of perpetual hobby and not be sort of vaulted to this like art form mm. space. Did you see the danger in what? He didn't, I don't know if he saw what I saw regarding like the fact that you dig deep and then you have nowhere to go you with see, it. You see like potential clients? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he had all of his clients, I think at the beginning, were all actors. <laughs> yeah. There you go. So it was, it was opportunistic. relatively perfect. <laughs> um, yeah, opportunistic uh, switch of, uh, of occupation. But um, yeah, so you'd have these, these, these walls and... And then you would hear just this really muted screaming from upstairs because um, he would role play and be like, I'm your father. What do you want to tell me? And so you'd have, you know, clients being like, fuck you, you know, and he'd be like, that's good. That's good. But the interesting thing, and I, you brought up Flannery O'Connor and I don't believe, um, I don't believe she, she or he, Flannery. Yeah. You, are you asking? Yeah. She. Yeah. Did she write a short story called The Sin Eater? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I think she might have. Yeah. Anyway, um, The Google Sin it. Eater is a, is a great short story, but my father reminded me of The Sin Eater. I read it in high school, and this was all going on in high school. He would come down from these sessions with no one to therapeutif- therapeutify him sure. post-therapy for other people. So he's absorbing all this what emotion. Do do? What did he do? Where people where he's role playing, people are literally cursing at him. Yeah, um, and then he comes down and he was a mess, oh, no. total mess. You know, angry, really, really angry and offended, <laughs> just just in a bad mood. You yeah. know what I mean? So um, anyway, so they eventually sort of got divorced, but that was all in the valley, um, and somehow, perfectly so. Somehow the valley really was the perfect place for that post hippie sort of mid what's that form of music that's like you know spiritual music that uh, you know that had a name new age yes mid new mm-hmm. age like vangelis like blasting vangelis screaming out you know like, like wind chimes wind chimes yeah. granola uh, yogurt sunshine those- sweat those rain sticks? Yeah, rain sticks. Uh, uh, a lot of um, cursing at your own shadow, but it being this exhilarating thing. And all all very sort of like 1984 Valley, mm-hmm. you know. Um, it, was, it was actually relatively perfect. Just enough removed from Hollywood and, and thank God removed enough from sort of Santa Monica and Beverly Hills for me to actually have a, a relatively in touch upbringing with, and by in touch I mean sort of just rootsy upbringing, uh, where I went to school in really, uh, particularly at elementary school, really really small elementary school called the Children's Community School, mm-hmm. um, and uh, you know a lot of just like playing in dirt, no grades, you know that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so in all this kind of, because it sounds pretty. I mean, obviously, when you, you anything you reflect on and describe, it's it's in its potent form. Yeah, you know, you lay it out chronologically. It's not as obvious. I'm right. assuming. So, where are you in all of this? Yeah, so I, I'm just like a, you know, it's funny because I have a daughter now, and I and I see that she was born who she is. Um, you know, obviously, we we give envi- the envi- environment provides inputs uh, and we have epigenetics and uh, and layers of genetics that we sort of absorb through our experience on earth but they're all layers or additive to the sort of this essential being that we're sort of born as Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that I can now see that about myself and and see that i have 
sort of really always been the same person. Mm. More myself, I identify more with my myself of five years old today than I think I ever have. I, th- I think I'm more like myself, my purer self or, or my childhood self than I w- was. I think I think the ages of thirteen through through twenty two really or maybe even 27, um, we're all sort of just like confused years of trying to sort of self-identify. Yeah, insecurity. Yeah, insecurity, really sort of trying to identify as something when you haven't realized that you already have been identified yeah. by your creator as one particular thing. <laughs> yeah. um, that said, like the particular, you know, I, I've always been... Um, I've always felt myself capable of absolutely anything, be it, and I sort of mean subject matter, uh, capable of English, capable of math, capable of of speaking, capable of swimming, capable of running, capable of of writing. Um, coupled with then, I think that that was sort of the more natural genetics, and then the the layer of genetics that I sort of absorbed was this: you're a bum aspect that my Mm -hmm. dad would keep telling me you're a bum (laughs) yeah and I wasn't good at I didn't I didn't like school I didn't care for it I didn't I truly remember thinking even at five years old like this is silly Mm -hmm. (laughs) this is not something I want to do want to do in fact my mother in order to try and help me sent and by the way I was in I was in therapy myself since the age of three because I was a bad student bad like three-year-old you know what I mean like like in preschool um that was like a, a roused about I don't know what the, what the problem was exactly well, but three it's three three years old that's, yeah. that's just three years old though it's pretty young I'd say yeah yeah <laughs> pretty young so so you know and then of course you know there, there was there was just a lot of drama in the household and I started to become the focus of it because i the, was the so sort of child? strong-willed. No, my sister was born at when I was three, actually. Okay. So, um, for instance, I got sent to a piano school called the Yamaha, sorry, Suzuki? Suzuki, Suzuki. School of Music. Yeah. I was five, in which at the end of every session, you have to bow to your teacher. And I refused. So I got kicked out. Or, you know, I there was a new tire jungle gym uh, that they brought in. Uh, it was about the same age. Um, and they had just brought it into the preschool and they sat us all down to show us how to do it and the precautionary measures and all that. And I got up during the teacher's speech and said, no, 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 this is how you do it. And just started climbing it. And my parents get called in. Oh, we're going to send them to, we're going to send them to more therapy. A lot of those sorts of incidences of yeah. like, um, sort of a belligerent, a belligerent, will on my behalf mixing with sort of this um this this misconception that I really was sort of a punk but I wasn't a punk actually I was actually just sort of um really charged <laughs> to do things uh yeah. immediately that seems like to me you spoke just you just spoke a different language yeah I, I think so and I, and I think that you know it's odd that I think that my folks couldn't quite see that um I think my mother sort of saw that but she she worried over me profusely I mean it was always what are we gonna do about Alex and and I think my you know my sister would tell me now that like it was pretty difficult growing up in that family because the focus was so much I was sucking up so much of the worry and attention and uh and creating so much of the drama between my mom and my dad and um, but generally to fix my problems, uh, as they were called, I would go to professionals. So I would go to, um, a lot of, a lot of tutors and a lot of like, uh, eyes, like I, like a sort of cognitive, uh, therapy specialists. And, uh, um, I, I, my mom keeps saying I was dyslexic. I don't really ever remember being dyslexic, but Apparently I was dyslexic. I also had this weird. The, the woman across the street, when I showed her the address, said he might be dyslexic because I think those are wrong numbers. Oh really? So I'm just saying. What did I say? Seven two eight? No, you said two seven eight. 
<laughs> oh, right, right, right. Yeah, I, I do get confused sometimes. All right. Well, she, I mean, if you want to talk to her, she's right across the street. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll go give her a piece of my mind, <laughs> a mind of my piece. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I, it's possible that I was dyslexic. Um, I remember one time, yeah, a lady pointing at a face and saying, What's missing? Uh, and I said, Nothing. And there was no mouth, you know, that kind of yeah. thing. I was just like, yeah. I was like, nothing's missing. Yeah. And I remember she'd be like, there's no mouth missing? And I'd be like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I guess. Um, I guess so, yeah, sure, if you say so. Does uh, you need a mouth? Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so I suppose I had those issues. And then, and then you know, and again, then all of this shit I'm saying about, you know, how how definitive my character was... Um, all flew out the window really at the age of 13. At 13, I really, entering junior high, really started actively being like, okay, how the fuck do I socially survive mm. under these ginormous circumstances of, you know, now I'm in a large pool of people and uh, I do not like, I do not like school. <laughs> I should like do a, a Dr. Seuss, I do not like <laughs> school, school I am. Uh, version of this, but you know, I'm stuck in school and, and here I am. So how do I get by? And, um, you know, and, and I think that's where I started to sort of, you know, veer in every which way. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, and I'm not, obviously I'm not a doctor, right. as you know, but I would imagine that up to this point you had been, uh, acting naturally, what came naturally to you and then just being, uh, inf- reinforced that, that your natural actions are problems. And now you're in a circumstance where you're finally becoming self-aware. And yeah. you, if, if how you're acting has always been told it's a problem now, and now you're self-aware that that can cause a lot of issues. Yeah. Right. right. You become that sort of self-aware, you become self-aware. And, and what I did and it's still actually my tendency is when things are going bad, um, to really investigate, by way of making them go worse. That, that's still sort of my tendency. Um, so, for instance, in a live show, if I screw up a note, I'm inclined to then want to screw up every... Just keep screwing up notes. It's jazz, man. Yeah. <laughs> in a way, it's a way of taking back the control of the mistake yeah. and owning it. Owning it, yeah. And then... And sort of decimating whatever embarrassment you had. So let's say I, you get embarrassed about something... In some ways, the cleanest way to sort of wipe that embarrassment away is to then get more, more embarrassed about that thing. To 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 shove your embarrassment right through the fire and onto the coals. Now, does that for you is that out of an insecurity, or is that now out of a developed confidence, an established confidence, to almost like you know what? Yeah, I, I fucked up, and I'm gonna do it again. Because I know who I am, and I'm 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 capable of still being good despite this, you know. Um, I think that there is an inherent fallacy to perfection ironically and so that when the perfect moment is disrupted by imperfection we experience an awakening that is actually liberating 
in recognizing that, for instance, going along singing or playing perfectly and suddenly playing imperfectly or doing something imperfectly wakes me up to the fallacy of the preceding perceived perfection. Mm -hmm. Not that there isn't divine symmetry or divine asymmetry and that things can't be elegantly and naturally beautiful and sort of essentially perfect, but that the disruption of that continuity can give you a perspective on the continuity that you didn't previously have. Um, And I think one thing that I've always had a real tough time with is reverence. I, I sort of, and I, and I think it's more of an intrinsic, like something I was born with. I I have a, an extreme reaction against reverence. And, um, in in what sense? Just in um, general? General, if, if you probably named reverence of any variety, I would probably say, yeah, I have a problem with that. Hmm. Um, the the only variety that I tend to express personally are in sort of relatively private moments. Um, yeah. Um, I'll shut this door right quick. Okay. Can I can I go back for a moment? Yeah. On the 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 perfection thing, I've been sitting with because you're talking about these perfect moments, it, not per, not perfect in the in the truest form but it's perfect through its brokenness. You know, like I, Tom Waits, for instance, I think is like perfect <laughs> and completely broken. And, and also, because I always think of it in terms of like, like working with classical musicians, you know, like I have strings in my band. And that's always kind of a, an issue is dealing with the perfection of the, of the string player that they want to achieve in rock and roll. You know, needing to understand that, no, no, it's actually through the mistakes and through the, that, that you get your characteristic and nuance. You ever heard of the term wabi-sabi? Yeah. Wabi-sabi, it's, it's a, 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 that's wabi, your posts right there. Like the ceiling. It's, it's achieving almost a maximum beauty through its brokenness. Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't come in here and say, we need to, this is horrible. We need to redo it. Maybe you have, but like, (laughs) but there's a value to that. You know, there's a value to its imperfection. Yes. That, that, that act is real. Yeah. And I, I feel like that's the difference, like with rock and roll, that's, uh, with, I say rock and roll, our kind of music, uh, it's like, how else could Iggy Pop be? Right. Right. Well, you know, as you said that, I think I've been able to refine what I mean. And it goes, um, I'll wait for Nico to pass. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. Do lay down some tracks. All right. All right, man. I'll see you in a bit. Um, reverence for continuity is what I mean reverence for that that variety of reverence that to me feels stifling to change um reverence that is stifling to change yeah i think that reverence in general actually is stifling to change unless your reverence is to change (laughs) um i think that reverence in general outlasts the impulse that first birthed it like tradition or like um, anything that becomes customary Hmm. outlasts the initial impulse that created that custom and at that point past which the initial impulse is still alive and the custom and the reverence to that custom is all that is left at that point, I have very little tolerance for the inertia of reverence. But how would anything have value then? Because isn't, if, if we give reverence to something, and I use value in a general sense, but sure. 
that we have we have value we acknowledge as a value to something and we we are reverent to its value are you saying that that value is only momentary and beyond that point it it no longer exists well no i you get in what you put out something that new orleans has taught me is there doesn't need to be a reason to do anything in order to create a reason from doing anything so Mardi Gras or these second lines on a rainy day where anywhere else they'd be canceled. You get up, you get dressed, you, you put on some crazy shit for no reason and you go out and you start dancing in the street in a vacuum or in another city. You might not get out what you put in or you might not. I should say you, you would always get out what you put in. You might not be able to convince yourself that this is something worthwhile you know, something worthwhile. Mm. Um, and in fact, when I arrive at second lines for the first 10 minutes, I'm unconvinced that I should have, that it's going to be worthwhile. And then within, you know, once I start contributing and start dancing, basically, suddenly I'm contributing to this overall sort of, it is a tradition that is going to flake off the face of the earth without without people sort of entering. having reverence for it, entering it, putting yeah. something into it. So it's a, it's a, it's a communion. Yeah. It's, it's a, a communion. Yeah, it is. And it's, and you know, and it is tradition. And while the tradition is in its sort of, uh, hibernation during the summer, mentally, I would imagine it's possible to sort of lose reverence for it and just sort of not really, you know, be able to gear up for it. For me anyway, it's like, well, yeah, I don't know. And then suddenly the time comes around and it's, you know, it's cold outside. I don't want to go outside, but you go, you force yourself out and suddenly you're getting out what you put in. And for me as a Los Angelian, as a spoiled brat, essentially, it's a lesson that I'm learning. I think if I would have grown up here, it would be some more of an epigenetic layer that, that, that was, that was really part of me. But, you know, it's it's not because essentially I was spoon fed uh, everything throughout my life, you know, as, as like a middle class, upper middle class kid, you know, soccer games and track and field meets and uh, and everything is everything I ever experienced really was curated. It's not like I was given like two ice blocks and a bunch of styrofoam and told to go play in the street. Mm -hmm. I was picked up by some other kids' parents and taken to a gym and put into a program or I was, everything was curated. Or here, um, there's a lot less that's curated. It's a lot more sort of self-driven um, idea, like, you know, sort of make up what you can and run sort of thing, you know? Yeah. I love this conversation. And, and this is, but I think we need to be careful with language because curation would that be the word <laughs> to curate uh sometimes we need to be curated to enter into that freedom state do you like it, for instance like um going up on stage or something like like uh entering into the moment of the performance or going to second line there is in a, in a very small way something you put yourself self through to be able to enter into that the, the idea of completely letting go takes an action. Yeah, I mean, well, like, let's get, like, like for instance, you mentioned Tom Waits, right? So what I would like to see from Tom Waits is for him to suddenly break and not sing with a raspy voice and make fun of the fact that he's been singing with a raspy voice and doing this particular trope of himself all along unflinchingly without breakage because the continuity of his being that he's presented to us for me i just don't trust it hmm. i don't trust continuity you um, think there, there seem there there at some point begins to be an inauthenticity in it i just i have it and and that's the reverence i believe that our society is really reverent to continuity if a man is going to be a non-laugher, then he needs to remain a non-laugher. But in reality, I have 
80 men living with inside, you know, inside mm-hmm. of me. I, I, I laugh, I cry, I skip, I walk, I dance, I try, you know, I'm mean, I'm nice. I feel. I feel. Yeah. All of these things. I, I feel that schizophrenic sort of, um, what they call in, 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 in physics, like just the tendency to be one version of me, but only the tendency. Mm-hmm. I have innumerable, on innumerable moments, been other versions of, iterations of myself and, and with only a tendency to be one particular way, mm-hmm. you know? And so I suppose that reverence, for instance, to making an album that is an album through and through from one song to the next to the next, and it's a complete, unbroken album, thought, it's just this... Are you, are you making fun of me? It's No, <laughs> just, it's not. haven't heard your album. <laughs> but it's just this unbroken, sort of like continu- con- continuous space. And for me, fine, that's cool. I love those albums. I enjoy them. But breaking that is also good. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't enjoy... Uh, I do not enjoy con- like reverence to continuity. Um, and I, in fact, I think that that's a large part of what drives me on stage. We do not have set lists because yeah. I, cannot, I cannot stand the thought of a set list. I cannot stand the thought of curating a show for people. Okay. Cura- it comes back to curation again. Like yeah. I, do not, I do not like curation basically in its, in its core function. Curation is the obviation or the obviating of the moment. If I'm precogging a curation for you that's going to happen in four hours, yeah. that means that I think that I know what the fuck should happen in four hours. When I don't know what should mm-hmm. happen in four hours, then what about the moment? What about the, the girl who happens to like turn this way and the guy who happens to like shout out you know, whatever you should, like rascal. And I'm not going to incorporate that into my show now because I curated a, a, a certain sort of dogmatic approach yeah. to what I want you to feel during that moment. Now, of course you can do a hybrid of curation and incorporation and all that. But for me, my, my hi- hierarchy of objectives is that the moment is far, far, far head and shoulders above curation. And so you have, you have reverence for the Holy Spirit. I have, re- yeah, that is my reverence again for, for, for like the, for the, yes, fine. I have reverence for the Holy Spirit. Yes, that is what it is. I, I have reverence for the moment and for whatever discontinuation or continuation that that moment heralds. I do not have reverence for anything really beyond that. In fact, I start to get really aggravated and genuinely rebellious <laughs> when I start to sense that reverence is being either a sort of forced upon me or forced upon the culture that obviates a genuine moment just for the sake I, of this reverence. I completely, I completely agree. And, and I, I completely agree. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, there's things I want to talk more about reverence, but it's like, well, we, we've talked about reverence. Well, reverence, I use it as a buzz. Obviously it's I'm guess. using certain words like your, they're rhetorical. They have, they, yeah. they're buzzwords. Like reverence is something that most people like my find to be a positive. Yes. And me. reverence, but That's I like using thing. the word reverence <laughs> because it distra- it's a, dist- I'm using it destructively. Yes in order to achieve, to, to allow like whoever's going to listen to this. And I don't do this. I didn't precog that. It's for me. I want to remind myself yes. to destroy things that, to walk on the eggshells. Yes. Because that's where we discover like where we actually stand. You, you understand about yourself that your, your best form is in the moment. Yes. And, and I say yourself, not implying that, but that's not true for other I'm just saying you we've all we we all we can do is work on our our own yeah purest form yes and for you the purest form is in the moment yes and you can see that on stage i mean one thing i wanted to ask you is i've seen you guys a couple times and and you just walk out and what what do you want to talk about tell me a story who's got a story like that's completely in the moment and and like in in those Cause, yeah, because if you sit, it, but it's not continuous in the moment. And I, sh- I would like to describe to you exactly what do. that those moments are like. And I was going to say, what are you looking for? One more, come on! You're burning to tell it. You're burning to tell it. Where is it? About it. About a year ago, you guys made a yes. the hospital. Yeah. 
Do you remember that? Oh, oh. Yeah. Uh-huh. I got a transplant that day that saved my life. Hate it. Well, it's not what I'm looking for. It's what I'm experiencing. So what okay. I'm, I have an objective. The objective is to be in the moment. The objective is to follow my instincts and to trust my instincts. And I can get into how I came to that. I came to that when I was about 24. Like, it, it, I really needed to... Actually, no, later. 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 Because I was part of a club that... Anyway, we talk about this later. Okay. You know, it's almost like a separate conversation. But the idea, basically, of that I am good... I'm a decent. I, I'm okay, and it's safe to be unsafe wherever I go. You're you're okay I, as a person or musically. You're. you're I mean, talented. okay in the biblical sense. Sure. My spirit is okay. Yes. My spirit is decent, and there's nothing that I need to be ashamed about about who my spirit is and what its instincts are. Mm-hmm. I trust myself to this point now, where I can follow these instincts, and even if I do something that might be offensive or something along those lines i am living in part of a process and i can forgive myself relatively quickly Mm -hmm. for any missteps but i can also trust this process and by trusting it one of the major parts of the process is the moment and whatever instincts i happen happen to have can i ask you a question at this point (laughs) yeah yeah in this moment is it an action i think so i do or is it a listen are you listening? I'm listening. I'm listening. It's I, receptive. You're receptive. I, I'm, I'm clear. I'm trying to clear my mind. Yeah. And allow whatever instincts, impulses, uh, allow that tuning of that reception to allow direct, un, unmediated access to my body and my muscles and my mind yeah. and guide me. Now, what actually happens, once in a while, like let's just call it the zone because that's what people like calling it. The zone, let's say, is is where, for me, those instincts have completely unmediated access to my limbs, mouth, muscles, everything. Free. Totally Freedom. free. Yeah. Unmediated. Just like I'm, I, I've not... There's no five-second delay for me to catch yeah. expletives. No editing. There's no editing. Yeah. Everything... Outside of that, and let's say in, in a show I'm in the zone, in a great show, let's say, like a, my best show I'm in the zone maybe 70% of the time, let's say. That would be an amazing show. The rest of the time is a discontinuous, kind of like a film, where it looks continuous, and, and, and ideally it looks continuous to everybody else. And, and, but the reality is, Actually, not ideally. I'd actually prefer everybody to see me nakedly on display going through these thoughts because the thoughts are unmediated instinct, go here, I catch it, don't go there, wait, why? And then another sort of reversal of, of, of thought, why are you mediating? You should just allow this thought to go through. This all happens in a split second. Yeah. Naked thought, I catch it, I decide whether or not to do it, then I chastise myself very quickly for catching it, deciding not whether or not to do it. Mm-hmm. Then I decide, okay, now that I've caught myself and I, it's not totally flowing, now what do I do? Because now I'm still. Now I'm at zero again. Mm. Do I follow through with the initial instinct even though now the impulse has passed and I would be doing it strictly to sort of enforce yeah. and prove to myself that I can do it? Right. Or do I just allow the next thing to come? Right. And it's these sort of choices that are happening... Yeah. Like a like a piece of film, like 24, 24 frames a second, mm-hmm. those thoughts are happening and occurring and occurring and occurring. And that the courage doesn't come into play until you are in that precarious sort of conversation with yourself. Mm. When you're in the zone, you're in the zone. You don't need courage. You need courage to get into the zone, maybe. But once you're in the zone, you're in the zone. It's, yeah. uh, it's like this amazing metaphysical zone. But as soon as you're out of the zone, in order to make those little micro decisions, each one of them takes courage. So, for instance, when you've seen me and I come out on stage and I decide to go to the girl or, or, or the boy or, the, or, or the, the, the hop on something or to do a weird spin or to throw my hands in the air or to shout or to make a moan, 
I couldn't tell you, depending on what show, which that was, if it was genuine in the zone or if it was um, mediated. Yeah. And it took a lot of courage for each incremental movement. I remember on stage in I'm a Robot, my previous band, I refused to smile. And when I would have instincts to smile, not instincts, when I would have the actual <laughs> urge to smile, I would suppress it. Yeah. I would suppress it because in this band and this thing, in this moment, I don't smile. I'm, I'm You're trying a robot. to, I'm just a, I'm a destroyer. I'm, I'll smile when I'm bleeding and that's it. Mm-hmm. That was my, that was sort of my thing. Or smile if I've hurt myself. It was all about self-destruction. And I got to admit, most, I would say most shows, probably 90% of the show are these internalized conversations and only 10% for most shows are me completely swept up, absolutely mindless, almost to the point where I'm just watching myself. Yeah. And I'm able, sort of almost outside of my body, just consciously to witness um, the Holy Spirit, as he said. Yeah. I love my God, God made me. But I don't want to pray to my maker. Well, I'm gonna. I, I gotta. Like, I gotta ask: Is it possible that this conversation exists outside of yourself? It it exists in in contemporaneous with my act, activi- activities. It's not like I stop each time I have to deliberate, mm-hmm. but you know. So I'm, my body's moving, and meanwhile, I'm like, well, which one is it? Do mm-hmm. I do this or that? Am I going here or there? You know. And no, but I mean, like, a, it, like for what you're describing to me is participating in a dialogue yes with with the objective of freely entering entering in in a free state to be completely open as part of your end of the conversation with the audience i 100 percent understand agree with what you're saying but for me it's a dialogue not with myself but with me trying to to be open with god and enter into that like what am I? Use me. Yeah, right. Not in like a. No, no, no. Me I, like a, I'm evangelizing. No, no, but no. Like, use, 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 use me as a tool. I mean, you know, for the, again the Holy Spirit thing. I'm, I'm. For, for me, it's a little more utilitarian and sort of like feet on the ground um, because there are things that I feel like societally and personally that I deal with and that we deal with regarding personal suppression and social suppression and and social anxiety uh even imperceptible social anxieties that 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 really run our world that it is my job or part of my job to help us with when i'm on stage when i'm off stage i'm far less myself i'm far less free than i force myself to be on stage when i'm on stage i genuinely take it as my duty to break the fourth wall, the glass ceiling, the ice, whatever you want to call it, and allow the purity of humanity and myself and communication and joy and the moment and reality to communicate through me to whoever's watching that it is and this is going to sound completely pompous, but this, this is my, my, my innermost desire, that it is possible to be free and exist within society. That there is another level of interaction that we can all engage in that is better, more pure, more loving, healthier, more healthy, yeah. more electric, more powerful, uh, than we have intended to en- uh, or tended to engage on, uh, at, and um, and that would be my big gigantic hope 
for the world and and whatever I can contribute to it because I think that that you know when I think about music and I think about superpowers I listen to someone like you know Ray Charles and I think why am I even doing music mm. he he already did it for us listen to that voice I cannot sing like that mm. and I think about why am I doing music what is my superpower my voice has gotten better over the years and I feel like I'm finally being able to express the way that I want to express but I wouldn't call it a transcendent superpower of mine like the way Ray Charles voice was for his so when I thought to myself because I have often thought like why am I doing this should sure. should I continue because I want to have maximum impact while I'm here is that on stage live the performance and everything I was just referring to that is my superpower. Mm. That is the reason to continue. Uh, if if I can say, I, from my perspective, I would say your superpower is your is your boldness to actually go for it. That's that's yeah. that's what I mean. Okay. I mean the the idea that I'm special and can access that specially is nonsense to me. I would say that you you are right uh, in in and and that's what i was trying to describe yeah. is that the superpower is more of my super willingness to have to 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 expose myself to that degree of the moment uh which does take courage so what hit me and i love it <laughs> and i love you for it <laughs> seriously it is your the superpower is the strength to be free enough to go for it and the mission is to reveal that it's not a superpower at all yes amen that that, that, that well or the mission is to reveal that we all have this exactly. we all have this that, exactly. we can all do this at any time i mean you know like and that's needed oh it's so needed i mean that 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 sense of 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 liberation from each individual, it will manifest itself in di- in different ways, and I think it'll we just got somewhere. Well, I yeah, feel really good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it'll manifest itself in different ways, and it'll look different on each person coming from each person. But there's no denying when you meet anybody who you can suddenly feel is like completely in some moment, probably not all the time in their lives, but you you run across someone who just is vibrating yeah. at some electric sort of completely open mm-hmm. level. It's at once fearsome because it it basically throws a mirror onto your own self suppression. Your mask. And at uh, your mask. Yeah. And challenges you to take it off yourself. Yeah. Um, but it's also inspiring. Yeah. So it's like, you know, and it, it's this funny, ironic sort of like it's just a story that you always hear is like this, this, the, the guru that's always saying gurus aren't real, you know, like the guru that's like, don't follow me. I, I'm like, you know, like I, there are no gurus and yet everyone then, you know, just sure. doesn't, doesn't hear that part and then just, you know, continues, continues on. Well, thankfully I'm not a guru by, by any stretch of the imagination. The only and, and, and I really do believe that what I'm able to communicate communicates, especially because that, and that's one of the only conscious, really like conscious decisions I make is to go into the crowd. Yeah. Because once I break that wall and start dancing with other people or having other people come on stage, yeah. suddenly we, we both have that superpower and suddenly it's like, well, as you can see, everybody, it's not just me, is it? It's, it's you. It's, it's you. It's you. It's you. It's, it's not a, about it's you. Who, exactly. It's about us. Exactly. And that's, I mean, that's a meta, The concert could potentially be a metaphor for life. Yeah. It's about us. Yeah. And when we, when we can stop looking at the monuments in front of us and, you know, putting these masks on our face so that we can either be more like a monument or we're ashamed of where we stand from the monument when we can take it off and realize it's not about the monuments. It's about humanity. Yeah. It's about our, our love and, yeah. and being, a, a, it's about communion. It's about being a community. Yeah. 
and giving yourself permission to 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 be yourself, to to express yourself to your yes. It's not conformity to your fullest. No, no. Community is made up of members. You yeah, know, of, in, of individual members yeah. who have their their DNA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good stuff, man. It's like you know, and and you can feel, you know. And then we come back to curation, but you can feel that. I always wonder how it is that Edward Sharp and the Magnetic Zeros was able to transmit what we're talking about without even having played live. How was it that I was able to arrive in Missoula, Montana, in a shitty mood, in a town we've never played, and go out on stage and see a sea of kids who were already had like given themselves permission to be to be free mm -hmm. and were exuding that high degree of of electricity and for me to be hit with it over the head as soon as i came out every all my bullshit dropped to the floor and i was able to just like join them mm -hmm. and have a good show and 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 have a transcendent experience how was it that we were able to transmit that and you know it comes down to something akin to magic um, that finally science is catching up with it, that intention, thought, space itself is stuff. Mm. We transmit ideas. The zeitgeist is real. Um, what you think affects the world. Mm -hmm. You know, state of mind is... is The world is breathing. The world is breathing. And, and, res and with air, it resonates. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and with humidity, it resonates even more. Even more. <laughs> uh, you know, because that's why I like a really hot room, because the, hot, the, the wetter the room gets, the more it's l quite literally a single body. You mm -hmm. know, the closer it reaches like 80% density, like the more we become more or less the density of a single, en single organism, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so I, that that's the that seems to be the goal, and then I was gonna say why, but like you've we've talked about why 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 is this important? Oh yeah. Well, I think it's important to me because you know, honestly, actually, I, I'm not so sure. I think that that's more of a mystical that's more of a mystic question. Is like why why are we personally attracted to the things we're attracted to? Why are, why are we personally have callings um, to certain things and you know, I could I could point at the reality that I experience a ton of social anxiety myself, along with a ton of context, and for whatever reason, and I and I and I, and I do think that this is somewhat of a gift that I'm very thankful for. I'm able to think of on multiple tiers at once: the personal, the group, the God perspective and sort of experience what it's like to be socially anxious and have a complete breakdown while at the very same time feeling totally calm and forgiving myself for it because mm -hmm. I know that it's absurd that I'm even experiencing it. And I think that a lot of, I think a lot of people have had that sort of thing where you, there's actually this, this, uh, a, a great Osho exercise. I'm not, um, necessarily, uh, saying that Osho is a great person, but he has a great exercise. I don't even know who that is. Mystic, like okay. Indian dude who got into some trouble. But um, if you're sad and you're crying, cry more. Cry as much as you can. Scream out, I'm so sad. Mm. I'm so, so, so sad. I'm so, 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 so sad. I'm so, 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 so sad. I'm so, so sad. I don't understand. Am I supposed to stop you? No. Okay. No, you're not. You're supposed to keep going until you have a break and you start to sound absurd to yourself. Oh, yeah, yeah. And suddenly you get the meta perspective. Yeah. So you work, you don't work through it from the, what it does is it breaks you from your personal sadness and gives you a sudden yeah. meta perspective. Perspective, yeah. So that, 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 that ability to have perspective while having social, continual social anxiety myself, just like everybody else on earth, I don't think I'm, I have any heightened social anxiety in comparison with, you know, the average person, yeah. but I do experience 
a perspective that leads me to believe that we do not need to hold on to that yeah. and that it is very detrimental and that a lot of the negative, um, horrible aspects of humanity are predicated on that social anxiety. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think what you exemplify in these moments is that the freedom from it is possible. Yeah. And it's worth pursuing. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's why people do Burning Man. That's why mm-hmm. people like have these intentions to intentional communities or, you know, I mean, I think that's, that's a lot of what this, the, the, the late 60s were about and, and, and what drug use is about and what uh, going to, you know, the religious experience is about, mm-hmm. going, to, going to certain kinds of churches, especially the, the ones where you're, you're encouraged to get up and charismatic. start. What's that? Charismatic. Char- charismatic or the, or, or the um, you know, the Baptist uh, 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 sort of, you know, hallelujah sort of, you know, inspired moments mm. of revelry. Um, those sorts of things I actually don't see as totally insane. No. I, I, most people, you know, most like sort of um, even sort of middle of the road, you know, sort of like, you know, Episcopalian type Christians would be like, well, that the whole like, you know, feeling the Holy Spirit and dancing and going crazy is, you know, or, or people sobbing and getting touched on the forehead and passing out is insane. But, but it's actually not because when you allow yourself to tap into the cosmos, essentially, you don't, you don't even know, like there's no explaining Mm -hmm. what will run through you. Right. And there's no explaining it away as self-generated because it is, it is a powerful force. And when you experience it yourself, you know that it's in combination, you are playing in combination with some exteriorized force that is not just of your imagination. This was something that jumped in my head a little bit ago that I just want, I think maybe we can end with this. Um, Talking about, for me, reflecting, and I I haven't reflected on this conversation because we're still having it. But, uh, obviously. (laughs) But but what what You're going to have to edit the shit out of this conversation. Oh, no, dude. I'm keeping it all. Um, (laughs) But what I love is is, is that the idea... The belief that, like we said, the superpower is is the freedom to take that leap and to be vulnerable and naked. And the mission is to show that it's not a superpower at all. An image popped in my head specifically, and it stuck out for me because that's exactly what popped in my head when I saw it. It was when you guys did um, Man on Fire on Letterman. And... I just remember when that came up, like when it starts, you know, what you're wearing, you know, you, you got, you look like, you know, you go from like watching Letterman and then all of a sudden this band comes on. It's like, where the hell are these guys come from? <laughs> you know, you got this hat. It's beautiful. And then you start playing. And I don't know at what point, but fairly in the beginning, you step out and kind of start playing with the camera a little bit and then kind of hop around chords and monitors and, jump down into the audience and then the camera backs up and there you are that person who is just like as an audience as somebody watching is like where did this guy come from is now among the people yeah yeah in the dark in too the dark. because they're not supposed to be yeah they're not prepared for that yeah among the people <laughs> yeah. and i remember at the time what you're saying come dance with me yeah it's an imitation yeah it's an invitation to be free yeah and you're like I mean this in the most honorable way. You're just like this weirdo up there, <laughs> yeah. like yeah. saying, "Well, you know, it's that, it's that, 
that weirdoness or that that willingness to laugh at myself uh, that I know you, you, that I know has a particular effect. It does, but yeah. but the most potent moment for me, and and it's it's so cool that Ed, we had this conversation. Like it popped in my head because I'm like, I I already thought of this. I thought of that very thing of of leading people to that freedom to take off their mask because as you walked up that those steps everybody looked a little uncomfortable they don't know how you know you the fourth wall is long gone and they're just sitting there in their seats watching not only somebody do something that's just typically not done which is the person is the fourth wall is broken you're now next to them uh but you're just you you just kind of have this like persona and disposition about yourself that just is almost like uh, the freedom is almost intimidating. Yeah. And there's one guy who reached his hand out. Yeah. That broke my heart. Yeah. Because it's like the one guy saw. He well, was like the one. <laughs> and do you mean the person that I, I yeah, reached yeah. out to? See, now, what was interesting about that, I realized the night before the show, before the Letterman taping, holy fucking shit, the lyrics are, come dance with me. Mm. What am I going to do? They'll never let me go out on into the audience. And I debated whether or not we should let them know that I am going to go out into the audience because I had a feeling that if I asked, they would say no. Right. And then if I did it anyway, we would be disinvited from ever yeah. doing it again. So it might be better to not let them know and just do it. Anyway, I kind of meditated on it and was like, okay, I'm going to ask them actually. And they said, yeah, okay, that's okay. So they actually they actually let me to their credit like like Letterman's wow. people were like okay <laughs> yeah they're like okay I guess so yeah um, so I had no idea what I was gonna do the audience is completely like dark darked out and it was first of all it's the scary Letterman playing on Letterman is easily the scariest place I've ever played like Josh says it's always freezing it's freezing it's yeah. intimidating it's it, the audience is completely dark they don't make any effort to sort of have there be like an integration with the audience like Jimmy Kimmel does or anything like that. So it's, it's really pretty terrifying. Anyway, Dude, that, and I remember when a, that... That's a metaphor for you having to go into that darkness. Yeah. It's a metaphor <laughs> for the leap that you were taking. It is, man. And I did not know how it was going to pan out, of course, because I had no idea what I was even going to do, what, what, what is there to do. And I went out and I remember that person reaching out their hand and I reached out my hand... Because I was literally like, well, okay, then come dance with me, you know? And so I, yeah. I grabbed his hand and I, and I asked him, like, you want to come dance? And, like, nodded my head, like, come on. And he, and he yeah. like, shook his head and said no. There it is. And, and, and it was okay because it's like, well, what, you know, what, what were we going to do then if, we, if you had done that? <laughs> but then I have to allow, that's another thing, like, that was a letdown. I, oh, I want him to come dance with me. Yeah. He, now he's saying no. He's not. He's not going to take my. I didn't liberate him enough. I didn't make enough of a fool of myself yeah. to make him think that it was okay for him to make a fool of himself. Um, yet I only had you know a span of a couple minutes, and it's national television. Yeah. I understand why he didn't Context. get up. But but, but you're going to get but, an email from him. But hey, I'll I'll seriously come dance with you though. Right right. <laughs> <laughs> Any so, other time. So the thing, you know, one of my favorite videos, and it's funny because someone ended up doing a TED Talk using this video as their springboard, and it's something that I had done for with a lot of people too, um, is there's a great video of a guy dancing like a lunatic at the Sasquatch Festival. I don't know if you've seen this video. I, I, maybe. Okay, so you should look it up. Everybody should look it up. And it's essentially uh, a lesson in exactly what we're talking about. Uh, in some senses, it's even a lesson in, in what a revolution looks like, um, what a cultural revolution looks like, oh, and, yes. and what a liberation looks like. Everybody joins him. Everybody joins yes. him. Yes. At first, a couple, a couple kids join him making mocking. fun of him. Yeah, mocking. Mocking him. But then it starts to feel so good mocking him and doing like he's doing that a couple more of their friends come in and they all start dancing really uh, goofy. Get, and they yeah. let it go. <laughs> And then all of a sudden, because the guy's holding the camera, is still holding the camera, all of a sudden you just start seeing a, exodus. an exodus yeah. of freedom and liberation. And it's pretty soon like in the thousands. I mean, it's like hundreds of people. Yeah. 
um, looks like about a thousand people start like it's just like a dance party of everybody just <laughs> booking it to this center of this this dance yeah. party that he started on this hill by himself minutes earlier. You know, and there's been some debate I've had with my friends who is the more important, you know, like, um, and I think the guy on, on, on the TED Talk talks about it too, like who is more important, the first guy or the guys that the mock, second, you know, the second yeah, guys. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you could debate that, you know, till the cows come home. But, uh, but, but that's essentially what we're trying to do. And I'll end it with yeah. just saying that or very early on with Edward Sharp, we had these shows we staged in LA on our own at this theater. The first show, and we were very unknown. It was a large theater and we were doing four weeks in a row as this sort of thing. And the first week I got up on stage and I reverted because of the fear of being in front of people. I reverted to my old ways of self-protection through, and my old ways were to, sort of be aggressive, show people that I don't care, that I have no fear up here through being sort of self-destructive and combative mm -hmm. and, and gain my sort of confidence that way. And after the show, I was really upset with myself because that's not what I wanted to do mm -hmm. anymore. And went on this drive with uh, Orfeo, our uh, percussion player, and um, we talked at length about it and finally just came up with when we go on stage, we're there just to be children in the sense that it's like a show and tell. We're, we're not rock stars. We're just people. And we're just going up there to share exuberantly, like to share with you what we think is really cool, something mm -hmm. we did, just like a child would, to be children. And so... We huddled up. We almost canceled the rest of the shows. But we huddled up for the second show. And I remember I said, you guys, we're not rock stars. We're children. That's all we're doing. And we're going up there to share. And that's it. And ever since then, that's sort of been, you know, the mantra. And to bring it back to religion for a second, yeah. as the, probably my favorite thing. I, I've, that it's I, already all, it's all religion for me. So. <laughs> my favorite thing that, 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 that we hear that Christ said is when someone said, how do you get into, you know, the kingdom of heaven? Yeah. And he points to a child and he says, be like, be like this child, be, li be like, to be, be like, like a child, uh, be, be like children. And, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously paraphrasing there, but he says sure. something almost like that. It's English, yeah. obviously, so it's totally paraphrasing. But, yeah. but that idea of being childlike, of being a child, of letting the, you know, recently at a show I said, I blurted out a, unprofessionalizing professionalism is my profession <laughs> to be childlike and allow that to come through and allow that purity to really speak that that that's one of the major keys to this liberation we're talking about and to everything that i care about and one of the keys i think to world peace to 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 forgiveness uh, because when when we see children do things that are fucked up we tend to forgive them um, if we can realize that we are children we can tend to our, forgive ourselves a bit more part of a process um, and we can be purer and um, you know whether that means more confrontation less confrontation as long as it means less self-modulating sickness and dis-ease mm. of societal sort of it's really it's it's really a perversion of ourselves that we end up going through and committing to um by you know engaging with society on the on the level that we do you know a daily basis and it's you know some people think that sickness is really a malady of the spirit this comes from suppression of the spirit and i don't think that's terribly far off in a certain sense uh, at least a certain definition of of sickness and um so you know yeah just uh, that following of the impulse the spirit and the trust in yourself that those impulses once you once you trust yourself and know yourself to be a, a you know on on the path and you've done your d diligence to trust those moments and those instincts in yourself is um and forgive yourself is um 
It's everything, man. It's everything. I told I tell my managers often because he he'll complain plenty about this was this this song was too long and that song was this and this was that and you know and those are all fair complaints and some people in the band have those complaints too and but I've I've told him before the only real complaint I want to hear from you if you ever have a complaint about a show is to let me know that I was being unauthentic if you think I was having a bullshit show, yeah. please tell me. Other than that, I'm probably not going to care right. about what you have to say. Yeah. Well, I think, <laughs> I, amen. <laughs> I think it's, it's a, an amazing cause. And uh, it makes me so uh, comfortable knowing that you're out there doing it. <laughs> good, good, good. You know what's really ironic, uh, uh, like, like, is that I'm actually known by my critics as being the opposite of authentic, as being a, this fraud who has this Edward Sharp persona that 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 behaves as if he's this blah 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 messianic yada yada. But that's only the only reason they. Anyway, it's just a funny thing. Well, but part of the reason they think that, and some of the most shit I've ever gotten is because I was in a punk rock band called yeah. I'm a Robot that was very, very, very different. different. Yeah. But breaking that continuity, again, is part of my part of my sort of like, if I have a reverence, again, it's to like breaking the continuity. Yes. So it's like, it's this funny, it's this funny sort of aberration of reality that, that I've gotten so much shit for being, for being a fraud when actually uh, it's... It's it's pretty it's pretty amazing, but it's also given me it's the reason why I'm writing this this uh, a book right now all all about sort of where our society's at social anxiety and all these all these sorts of things that we're talking about now. So you know, who else had critics that said he was a fraud. Who Jesus? <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah, there you go. So. No man, yeah. seriously. <laughs> when you're that boy, it's a becoming childlike. Yeah, right? it's the goal. When you're the boy on the tire, yeah, you were right. Yeah, right. That's how you. That's how you <laughs> right. use it. That's how you use it. You're right. Yeah, yeah. So you should, you, and I think you know that. <laughs> yeah, I do. Thank yeah. you so much for your time. Thanks man. so much. This Mike. has been great. Yeah, man. There you have it, Alex Ebert, a beautiful man, a deep man. That was uh, that was that was a great great evening, and and we actually when we when we ended, we talked for like a half hour 40 minutes more so we had a lot to say to each other and, and i was truly blessed by it i i, I had a uh, show that night in thibodeau louisiana and uh i was late i was late to it but i made it but i was late anyway um oh so, uh, one correction i mentioned we mentioned uh, when he was on letterman he reached out and uh there was a a man who 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 almost danced with them? It was actually a female. It was a woman. Uh, my memory was not serving me correct, so sorry. Uh, but hey, guys, thank you for listening. I, I I'm glad I'm I, this. It's such a, an honor for me to share this stuff with you. I have so many more of these, and so if you've enjoyed this one, if uh, check out the other ones. Uh, if if you enjoy those, get ready because there's a lot more great ones coming. And um, if you want to become a patron and help it continue, I'd appreciate it. Go to patreon.com forward slash Mike Mangione. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Mike Mangione. Go to MikeMangione.com to become part of Mystery Monday, my bi-monthly newsletter. Oh, yeah, do that. It's fun. I'm doing it. And uh, you better, you might as well join. Right? That's a pitch. Check out License Lab. You need to license something? Go to licenselab.com. L I C E N S E L A B.com. Okay. So for show and tell, I'm going to play the song that we talked about at the end there, the one that he did on Letterman. And I'm going to bring this up because uh, this is one of my favorites. And, and it, um, it hit me at a time when I needed it to. You know, uh, I, I don't, um, I, I don't, you know, performing music is very therapeutic for me as a musician, it, it really helps me. Listening to music can help me as well. And this was a song that came to me at a time when I was really needing it. Uh, I was going through some, some hard moments in my life. And when this song uh, entered into my life, 
It, uh, it didn't save my life, but it was buoyant in my sea of turmoil. And it, it gave me just for a moment uh, time to rest my arms, rest my legs, and rest my mind and just sit somewhere else. You know, it, uh, it held me up for a little bit. And, um, you know, I, I cherish that. And, I, and, and it really was special for me to, uh, to get to talk to Alex about that moment in, in, in Letterman because uh, that moment happened when I was struggling as well. And so altogether, it just, it's a special, it sits in a special area in my life. And so if you're having a hard time right now, a hard week, month, a hard year, uh, you know, I hope in some way the podcast helps you. But if not, um, I hope this song can, because I know it can, as it did me. I, I, I hope it can help you. So um, if you're open to that, I encourage you to just sit back and uh, open it up, man. Open up your heart and let this one uh, speak to where it needs to, uh, where it needs to fall. All right. This is uh, "Man on Fire." By Edward Sharp and the Magnetic Zeros. I'm a man on fire, walking through your street with one guitar and two dancing feet. Only one desire that's left in me on the whole damn world to come dance with me. See our bodies burning like old big suns. 